Ich habe mich gefühlt. Yes, hello, uh, good evening. Um, I'm Matthias Sense. I'm the uh, director of Ember Up on the Hill. Uh, most of you uh, won't know me. And I think uh, the reason why I have the great pleasure and great honor to introduce uh, Kati or Katalin Kariko, Kati for short, uh, tonight is uh, that for about 30 years or so, I've been doing uh, research on uh, messenger RNA. And uh, because of that, uh, I met Kati um, a few years ago. Uh, but before we go there, uh, let's uh, mentally uh, jump back about uh, 60 years um, to the 25th of May, 1961. So it was a Thursday. And um, on that Thursday, I looked it up to be honest. <laughs> uh, on that Thursday, um, sorry? Do you hear me better if I, okay. I normally, I'm normally being told that I have such a loud voice. That's why I avoided it. Okay, I won't. Um, so anyway, on the 25th of May, um, 1961, John F. Kennedy uh, gave a speech to the U.S. Congress uh, stating that America was entering the race to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. And indeed, about eight years later, as we all know, um, Neil Armstrong put his foot on the moon. So that took about eight years, billions of dollars, thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Now let's think of January 2020. In January 2020, gradually, humankind realized that there is a really threatening virus that could change our lives. And we all know it did. And some people decided that it was urgently needed to develop a vaccine against this virus. And you all know that by December of the very same year, we had a vaccine. How was that possible? We all know that this vaccine is changing and has changed, at least in my opinion, the way the world works, the impact of it, my opinion is greater than the impact of landing men on the moon. So how was that possible? Was it easy? Well, the answer is yes and no. If two companies independently were able to decide in January to build a vaccine and have it done within a year, clearly there had to be a recipe that could be followed by more than one person or more than one company and be successful. We also know that there are companies who have started the race and were not successful. What's the difference between those who were and those who weren't? Well, I don't know whether Kat is going to say it, uh, but I say it for sure. The ones that were successful, the two, Moderna and BioNTech, were using the knowledge and the patent of Kati's work, and those who are not using that did not succeed. So what that says is that it's really the preparatory work of Kati's work that laid the foundation to this success. Now, um, it's wonderful to have uh, sort of to know successful people um, and to celebrate with them the successes. Many of those have a history of success behind them, and they just kind of go from you know, pot of gold to pot of diamonds. Um, in the case of uh, Kati, I think that's different. And to me, that is far more admirable. So Kati, as I think may maybe the name already gives away, was born and raised in Hungary. Um, she uh, had an education in biochemistry and biology from the University of Szeged, which is where she obtained her doctorate. In the mid 80s, when you couldn't just leave countries like Hungary at free will, um, she left Hungary uh, together with her husband. I don't know whether he was he already your husband. Okay. So they left Hungary uh, to the United States 
because Kati loved science. And she realized that to do science in the way she wanted to do it, she had to leave Hungary with its constrained uh, conditions to do competitive research. She ended up in Pennsylvania, University of Pennsylvania, started to re her research, did a postdoc, as people do at that stage, um, then uh, obtained her first independent position. This is an amazing step in one's career as a scientist. You're so happy. You submit your grants with great ideas, and so did she. But the idea to turn RNA into something useful potentially as a therapeutic, was not an idea that was widely embraced. To the contrary, people were extremely skeptical for some good reasons, because it wasn't trivial. But Kati had the ideas and the determination to make it work. And uh, I'm sure she will give us some accounts. I won't go through it and waste time. Um, but let me make sure we all understand that this has been a journey of setbacks and struggles that through her determination and through her true love for science, she made happen. And by the time uh, it was uh, 2012 or so, um, she had shown that you could use a synthetically made RNA and use it in a successful way in an animal, in a mouse. Again, I don't want to steal her story. Um, and so through over 20 years of hard work and rejection, she already at that point had reached a step that in 2020 was super helpful to develop a su successful vaccine. So I. Uh, maybe finish there, maybe just adding that, um, you know, as one should, um, the honors that a person has received. Um, again, that is a very revealing. When you look up um, the honors Katya has received, then until the year 2020, for all the preceding 40 years or so, there are two. If you go from 2020 until now, I saw 42. Um, and uh, as we were talking tonight, um, you know, it's uh, 55 or something like this. And it includes every big honor you can essentially uh, think of. And where it does not yet include those, we, sh we should uh, stay tuned. Um, but Kati is not. Kati is not for the honors. I think Kati is for the impact that her research has. And that's, I think, we should all already give her a big applause for, because she has really helped humankind. Thank you, Cassis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much for coming. I am so many people here, I unbelievable. And first of all, I have to apologize. I work in Germany for eight years and I, I, I don't speak German. Um, as I mentioned, I came to Germany with my colleague at University of Pennsylvania and he was Japanese and even the English was hard for him. So I, it was, we did not speak German. And um, so that's why. And also apologize that this beautiful city, I did not come, although mine is so close because there was always another experiment to do. So that was my excuse. And um, today I thought that I talk about this mRNA as also as, uh, as my long and winding uh, road to develop mRNA for therapy. And so as uh, Matthias mentioned, I, was, I am from Hungary and in the middle of a uh, plain, I was this small town, Kisui Salash where 10,000 people live there, that's uh, where, where I grew up. And a typical family, we had a, a red roof ha and the adobe house, and I have a sister, my father was butcher, my mother was bookkeeper, and, um, and we had a very, very happy life I, as a child. And 
you know, we had many things which we did not have. The neighbor did not have, so I don't know that we didn't have television, we didn't have running water and uh, and the refrigerator, what nobody had, so I, we didn't miss it. And um, so we were very happy. And from my parents, I learned uh, not just that how to make sausage, I can make sausage, but I learned the, the way of life, you know, is hard work. And we worked also. We had yard, we had animals, and I have seen the chickens coming out from the eggs. So many, many experience. And and I was also a butterfly in the kindergarten. But I, I learned here in this uh, small town, I had the high school. It was beautiful building and uh, great teachers. I emphasize here uh, Albert Toth, who was the biology teacher, and he did a lot of uh, extracurriculum, uh, and uh, we learned so many things with so many uh, people, science, and everything was open, not like this is how it is, but we were thinking. And I mentioned here just one person. Actually, we sent letters to scientists, Hungarians, to uh, Americans, other places, and, and they responded. So. In these days, I feel that responsibility that I should respond and, and help uh, kids to uh, inspire them. So one of them is uh, Hans Scheyer, Janusz Scheyer, who was in Canada. And this um, scientist, we also sent him a letter. And when he responded, everybody read his book because it was translated to Hungarian. It was about stress. And Scheyer said, the stress word actually he used for the... Uh, feelings, not for the physical privacy, it was just physical, and in 30s he started to use that. And he said, believe it or not, you need stress. Without stress, life is boring. You don't have any uh, inspiration or, because that also stress, when you are inspired, you, you have a stress. Uh, but he said that uh, bad stress is not good for you, and uh, not really the stress is killing you, but how you perceive. And so, you have to practice to uh, the bad stress to make it a good one. So when you are fired, happened to me several times, then you say that you had a new opportunity and use this way. You have to practice this not coming automatically, but uh, then, uh, you know, I wouldn't be here, you know, if several times in my life I wouldn't be terminated and show the door. So it's, 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 you have to perceive this. He also said, you know, that... Uh, you have to focus on what you can do, okay? So if your uh, colleague earned more money, promoted, and uh, and works less, if you think about this, that you are already distracted. You have you cannot change that. You have to focus on what you can do, the science. So, or whatever is your work, but, and this is also for, for uh, human feelings, that so many people has grudge, for, forget it. You know, the, the, the people, uh, retaliation or thinking about, you know, just forgive. But if you are smart, then you ignore. Because even forgiving needs energy. So, so he said, ignore. And so, <laughs> it, it, it was uh, Shaya who said that, so I learned from him. And also that never said this kind of thing that, oh, what if I would have... Because again, it, it already happened. Don't waste time. So, so I tried to during the, because I di didn't have any religious upbringing. So that was my guide, this, uh, what Shaya was saying. So I uh, finished high school and I decided at 16 that I would be a scientist. I haven't seen one, but I imagined that every day going work will be do something different. And so I went to Seged. Seged is this southern point of Hungary. And I went to this university, Seged, excellent teachers. And again, the high school had excellent teachers. They motivated. And then uh, when uh, I was started as an undergraduate working in this biological research center, which was like top scientists there, and everybody was uh, knowing so many things. And also my high school teacher, I wanted to know as much as he he does. You know, that's so, is is a very inspiring and so here, as an undergraduate, uh, I started to work in the liquid lab. You know, my fellow student said, you know, liquid is absolutely boring. No? It's the kind of thing. But um, I working here, and Tibor Farkas was um, heading in, and on this laboratory, and um, uh, two young 
scientists uh, Eva Kondorosh and Ernie Duda, who, you know, very uh, thinking uh, about that making liposome and delivering uh, different things like a nuclei or virus or or a DNA inside the cell. And we are in the end of 70s. So this is so revolutionary. At that time, I, I didn't understand. Everything was new for me and everything I said, oh, wow, that's interesting. And so I started to work with them and I am telling this experiment because it uh, defined uh, my future. Because that was the first time nucleic acid we delivered uh, to, with liposome into a mammalian cell and the coded uh, protein we could detect. So that was in the end of the 70s. And uh, where I would go to the lipid lab, I go to the RNA lab. Again, as Steve Job once says that you just connect the dot, as you know, you get the vaccine, you know, the RNA is ripped up in, uh, wrapped up in a lipid. So, of course, it belongs together. But, you know, at that time, I didn't know it was by chance. And my supervisor, uh, Janu Thomas, actually uh, made uh, Everybody was in the laboratory, organic chemist. And that is also in the rest of my life. My colleagues were never expert on what I, I, I knew. So here everybody was organic chemist. I had to make uh, uh, viral assays and other things. But I myself also made RNA. So here Jenner was synthesizing uh, cap analogs because uh, who discovered one part of this RNA needed reference material. And so somebody had to make it. And uh, Aaron Shotkin in uh, New Jersey discovered the cap and uh, Janu sending him this uh, analog so that we could know that what is the structural uh, element in this RNA. And I worked together here with uh, Janusz Ludwig, who was also, who's also organic chemist. He's in, here in Bonn. And even today, I, I ask his advice. So if students are here, I can tell you that be kind to your fellow students because uh, you will need their advice. And so this is a, uh, one, one important thing. Uh, uh, and I even, even uh, this uh, weekly, I ask uh, his advice. And uh, he, um, uh, he uh, with him, we were doing not uh, RNA, the long one, you know, the messenger RNA. These were just short ones. Uh, we are in the early 80s and nobody could make messenger RNA then. And these um, short molecules had the antiviral effect. In 1977, it uh, was just discovered that this is the molecule responsible for the interferon-induced antiviral effect. And we made uh, enzymatically, chemically. I mentioned to you here again and other things for people who, student, that you are working on a field and keep following what's happening. Because right now I can tell you this OAS, this, this is an enzyme which can make this... Uh, uh, RNA piece for those people who get very sick from corona infection to now that they cannot make a good amount of uh, this enzyme. So it is the relevance of what you are doing once, maybe 30, 40 years ago, is coming back that, oh, oh you know this enzyme. And so it's good to follow not just what your colleagues are doing, but the, how the field is advancing. So we're working on this, run out of money, and I had to cross the ocean and go to a uh, Temple University in Philadelphia, and we worked on the same molecule there. And, uh, and this was about 10 years I spent there with this. And meanwhile, you know, uh, I, this field of RNA was advancing. So in 1961, not just uh, uh, landing the moon was important, but uh, discovery of RNA. And, um, and then in the uh, following uh, 1978 was an important that uh, RNA was delivered in mammalian cells, and that was uh, translated to be a protein. Now today, everybody knows that the RNA was injected to the arm and then get the protein and get immune response. But at that time, it was everything new, and the 84 was an important thing. That was the first time in a test tube RNA could be made by desire. But uh, it was 60 years was uh, when finally an RNA uh, medicine was uh, approved. So you man mentioned this here, sorry, let's shift it here, but it was May also 1961, two paper published that, uh, you know, the uh, RNA exists. So what it happened that uh, scientists were knew that um, there is a DNA in the chromosome 
and that carries the information. They knew that in the 50s. And the protein is what uh, is uh, actually is made, but uh, what is in between uh, was just guessing. And uh, they identified this uh, messenger RNA. I don't have to explain now. Everybody knows messenger RNA. And uh, so that's how it happens, that uh, from the chromosome, the RNA is uh, made, and, and then the mRNA will go to the ribosome, which is the protein synthesis machinery, and then the protein is made. And of course, you know, for the vaccine, is, it is made in the tube. But that was what discovered in 61. And uh, this first experiment I mentioned when a scientist, so 1978 was RNA used and delivered to mammalian cells, but they couldn't make as wish. They just could isolate from certain cells. And that is the reticulocyte, which became in our body red blood cell. And they have a lot of globin. And that's what they took out. And they used the same liposome that we did in the laboratory in Hungary, and then put to the cell, and then it entered to the cell, the RNA, and they demonstrated that the globin protein was uh, present. So that, that was quite revolutionary. And uh, the next step was when we learn that we can, we can synthesize an RNA on our wish. And this first experiment was done in, at the Harvard University, and this was an interferon coding uh, mRNA. And um, scientists realized when they have a DNA, that's the DNA is a template, just like for the vaccine as well. And there is an enzyme, and they put the four building blocks to the mixture, incubate, and two hours later, you get the RNA. And from one DNA is like 100 times you just making the RNA, so you can have a lot of RNA from a DNA. Of course, at that time, they didn't make the liposome, they just inject it to the fro oocyte because those are big cells, and it can be injected with a needle. And when they incubate it, they found that this uh, protein with this interferon was functional. So that was first time that synthetically an RNA was made and that RNA in the cell translated into the functional protein. And um, I was studying these things and I also wanted to do something, get to the game. And uh, I asked uh, actually those Harvard people that, can you send me the plasmid? And if you are in academic setting and you are spending time to write uh, material transfer agreement, at that time it was not. But of course, just sending a letter, not an email, it was no email in 80s, sending a letter and you ask uh, for a plasmid and the next day in an envelope arrived and they send you. So there were no material, in, we just like free, we gave out things. And this is how I got from them the temp, this plasmid, which had this promoter, and uh, I made using T7 RNA polymerase. This is a, from a phage, which is the virus of the bacteria. So if you are not scientists, you might surprise that even the bacteria had to worry about the virus. And, uh, but, so that was the, uh, it has a very high uh, fidelity and is what they used uh, in 85 actually was. And immediately when they discovered that commercially was available. Many things uh, in the 80s, second part of the 80s happened like that. And so it had the research. And so I made this urokinase receptor because it's a molecular biologist. First I worked in cardiology, and then you can be a card, you know, you can do molecular biology, it doesn't matter which department, because after seven years I went to neurosurgery. You know, a MD cannot do this kind of shift, but for a molecular biologist it's easy. And so I delivered the RNA, protein was made, and surprisingly, this protein is has so many modification which after the protein was made was had to be there and and somehow the cell knew all of these things it was so magic i just put the rna and um, which i made like two hours put there and uh, one hour later I, the protein is already made in the cell and i could analyze so so it was uh, immediately try to make different things for first in cardiology problem then when i neurosurgery for treating stroke with rna and uh, did a lot of uh, studies running around in the U.S., in Chicago, Buffalo. Somebody had a rabbit model. We tried to inject to see that whether this uh, nitric oxide synthase enzyme making a nitric oxide, whether we can see dilation of the blood vessel. 
but maybe it's not enough so that you always have, even you don't do an experiment, you are already predicting that what will be the problem and you are thinking about the solution. But of course you fa wait for the answer, but usually you get 10 more questions when you are science. So, and so I was doing all of these things when um, I bump into the Drew Weissman at the Xerox machine. I went the X word place because, you know, I know the password. And so I used the Xerox there and he was the new guy. He came from Fauci's lab, uh, Anthony Fauci. I didn't ring bell, you know, this was in 1987, 1997. And uh, Fauci was not in the television at that point. So, and I was not in, not virologic or immunologic. So Drew was the uh, one to make a HIV vaccine. And, and I told him that, oh, I am working on RNA. I will make RNA for you. And uh, if you think that it was first time, it was about like 30th time that, you know, I, I was this kind of RNA pusher. When I sit in a meeting, I ask, talk to my colleagues and I immediately figured out that RNA would be good for them. And I made RNA. And, and probably, you know, in the freezer somewhere in UPenn, you know, they have this uh, RNA and, you know, they didn't test it, of course. Because when I said somebody, hey, you know, what are you doing? And I said, I am working with RNA. They immediately look at me, this poor girl, because people who is scientists here and try to work with RNA, the RNA can do one thing, degrade. And, and uh, so, but... Um, yeah, so, but uh, I managed not to degrade the RNA. So Drew Weissman was working in a special immune cells called dendritic cells, uh, which is the antigen presenter cells, very professional um, uh, immune cells. And uh, when he tested out this gag, the RNA, which I made for him, he was so happy. He said this perfect vaccine. It uh, made so many uh, immune activation, inflammatory molecule. And then, you know, I am there who wanted to treat the uh, stroke patient and he's telling me the inflammatory molecule I made. So he was happy that this is the good vaccine. A lot of protein was made and I was absolutely disappointed. I thought that the RNA I am making is the same, which is in our cells, inside our body. And those are not inflammatory. Or we thought that, oh, maybe, maybe when it would be come out, you know, and then you we put and the immune cells coming from outside, like you have an injury, bump your head or something, and the RNA would come out your own cell. Maybe that's also. So to figure out that uh, what is coming from, so we did the experiment and isolated from the uh, mammalian cells, different RNA from different uh, uh, in in compartment and try to see that is it immunogenic. So the purpose shows, you know, that what I made, the RNA, and you can see the blue, what we isolated out, that was less, but still it was activating. But um, we realized that this tRNA there, uh, which is a transfer RNA, it had uh, not induced any immune response. You see? So tRNA is uh, already a very familiar because 25% of the uh, nucleoside in this uh, RNA is modified. So came to the idea that maybe this modification makes uh, the, uh, this, um, you know, molecule not immunogenic. So immediately we thought that, okay, we have to make an RNA which would have this modification on it, but uh, how, how could we do that? You know, just showing you the dilemma of, uh, of a scientist. So I just showing you this just to scare you a little bit because this is the hundred hundred different modification the uh, uh, RNA has in the and then so which one we should use and how we should introduce even you know this is normally you make you might not know but from four basic nucleotide you make your RNA all of the RNA tRNA mRNA everything and then after that there are certain enzymes coming and put these different things on on the RNA and the, the these enzymes were not even known not that I can order and uh, purchase and then test it out. And uh, of course, because I wanted to make mRNA, which called for a therapeutic protein, next worry was also that maybe then no, mo no more will call for any protein because it is too, com too complex and uh, it won't fit there. So, but we couldn't do this way. And so I asked Janusz Ludwig, who worked 
we work together on it. Where I can buy nucleotide triphosphate, which already had these things on it, and, and then try to root for the enzyme that you will accept and incorporate. So, based on his suggestion, I purchased these 10 uh, nucleotide triphosphates for the reaction, and uh, I limited uh, this just only which is in the human body. I didn't want something which in plant or something, just uh, nucleotide modified, which is in a human. And uh, so from the 10, five incorporated, so far so good, and we hope that those five, maybe one of them is uh, will be non-immunogenic. And so we tested out, and uh, similarly, we found that some of them were immunogenic. So the blue is showing the RNA, which I already made, and the orange shows some of the modified RNA, which is still induced uh, immune reaction. This uh, TNF-alpha is a very uh, inflammatory molecule. But you can see in the middle, some of them not. So when we look at closer, we could see that this is actually uh, uridine. When the uridine is modified, soon in the word uridine and pseudouridine will be as well known that mRNA, but here maybe you are not familiar, but so the uridine, when it was changed to pseudouridine or other, then it was not, not inducing immune response. So, so far so good, at least from, you know, we purchased 10, five was we made three of them, had the uridine modified, and um, and then uh, we try to see and hear that whether we can make protein. And this is what happened. We have found that one could not be translated. One was as good as the conventional one, but this orange was, you know, 10 times more protein was made from the RNA. So this was like, you know, dream come true, because now that we had an RNA, which code for something, so it is a messenger, and um, it is not immunogenic, and tons of protein is made from it. So immediately we had to try out whether it will work in animal, so we injected mice, and this was erythropoietin coding mRNA. You might heard the way EPO, you know, with the bicyclists, they like to use it. We use mRNA coding for the same protein, it makes a lot of uh, red blood cells, and uh, in uh, the red, you can see that even in animals, when it is, was this modification was introduced to the RNA, uh, four days we could measure erythropoietin in the blood. And if it is four days present in erythropoietin, then it meant that uh, you make more red blood cells. And um, if you just inject uh, uh, the protein, that is the purple, then it's two hours, is half-life, so six hours later, you is clear. So if somebody want to use the protein, for boosting, at least for four days constantly or three days, they had to inject because it is constantly degraded and that protein had to be there. Not that I want to give uh, advice to anybody. And and I did not even work on, on human, uh, human EPO. My daughter was uh, competing in rowing and that's an endurance sport and I never made human EPO while she was in um, uh, competing. What was important is that this RNA was uh, was not immunogenic, did not induce any interferon when we tested out. This is the middle panel you can see. And then on, on the right, you can see that when we injected this RNA, translated to a functional protein because the hematocrit increased in the animal. And when every week we injected a very tiny amount, if a scientist here, 0.1 microgram, that we injected, and that was the, we could maintain this high level of uh, of uh, uh, hematocrit value. I, I tried to look it up, you know, to have people understand what is microgram or what is this amount. So that like the 30 microgram, uh, the Pfizer vaccine has, for example, mRNA. Um, I can tell you that a rice a weight of the rice is 30 milligram. So if you cut up a rice to 1,000 pieces. You don't have to do that, just imagine. Then one piece, one piece is how much RNA is in that uh, uh, vaccine. So very small amount is, is sufficient. So this is where we were 2012. And um, then I have to leave and come here into Germany to BioNTech. And uh, BioNTech had no website. So accidentally, I just learned about the company. And when I met Ugur Zain, a uh, very charismatic leader. This is the picture was taken on that day. 
And um, I, he hired me and I said yes. And uh, I left my husband and family behind in the U.S. and I moved to, moved to Mainz. <laughs> and uh, I started to introduce BioNTech, the, this modified, this pseudo-uridine containing RNA, because I want to develop uh, for therapy. And um, so a lot of things here, just showing one example of what we did and published when uh, the uh, we did messenger RNA coded for a so-called bispecific antibody, an antibody which can see the cancer cells, very specific things on cancer cell and other uh, site is seeing uh, immune cells and brings together close proximity so the immune cells can see that uh, um, uh, cancer cells and, and eliminate. So that's what we were doing in animal study and uh, very well we could eliminate uh, the tumor shrink and uh, uh, disappear. Meanwhile, I was also working with my colleagues in University of Pennsylvania. And uh, uh, at that time, 2012, won first this uh, so-called lipid nanoparticle. Again, this is part of this vaccine. It has RNA, nucleoside modified RNA, and the lipid nanoparticle, which has four different lipids in it. And this was uh, developed by scientists in Vancouver. And, and uh, my colleague uh, started to uh, formulate uh, the RNA with this. Uh, uh, it, why, one important thing is that when this uh, form with the RNA with this lipid, then you can put in a minus 70, which you are already familiar, this word minus 70 freezer, but you can keep it there for years. We already had experience with it, and every year we took out another aliquot, checked out an animal, the effect, of which was, you know, again, erythropoietin. And this is favorite. Uh, molecule, erythropoietin RNA, and it was stable. So it meant that when you have a vaccine and you keep in minus 70, then it can be good for years. And when you have put in just minus 20, then every six months you go through the inventory and throw away, which already expired. So there is a benefit of, uh, you know, the slow temperature. But first time, you know, this uh, with LMP RNA, there is a shelf life. Because when I did those, uh, my study, it was that the RNA and the certain lipid was mixed, and in two minutes you have to inject, you know, one measured and, and inject. So it was not feasible for, you know, human use. My colleague, uh, Norbert Pardy, who happened actually that was the same small town, Kishur Salash and his grandfather and my father worked in the same butcher shop. And so I invited him to, to come to the U.S., and 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 probably he can make sausage too. So because this uh, because this whole family you know is uh, in this industry, but uh, he was doing here a uh, vaccine, and he actually published first time that uh, nucleoside modified RNA with this LMP against Zika virus because it was 2016 17 when it was made, and it was very similar this uh, vaccine to what uh, we have in uh, the COVID-19. And this was um, coded for, uh, for the envelope, which is on the surface of the uh, virus. It is always whatever is on the surface, that's what you have to target because that's what neutralizing that will block the virus. And um, when he did this uh, 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 his particle, he injected the monkeys. And what was uh, one surprise was that the antibody level was uh, increased even when it's very small, like 50 microgram. You already kind of know that 50 microgram like, uh, is, and very small amount was sufficient to increase the um, L antibody level. And uh, it also protected the animal when they were challenged. In the lower panel, you can see the animals, the monkeys, uh, which were infected, those who get this small amount of vaccine were not uh, get infected. And it was interesting because 30 microgram or 50 microgram was also required for a mice. And uh, I'm telling you that 30 microgram, what you get in your arm, it is the same what you have to give to the mice. So you don't have to scale up. And this was different from the DNA vaccine when in a, even unproportionally had to be injected more and more to larger animal and in human. So that was um, uh, what uh, Norbert uh, and uh, I... Uh, myself and with Drew Weissman uh, performing that was for Zika, repeated in influenza, different animals. It was for herpes simplex. 
and uh, many other viruses. And it seems that it was always working so well. And um, so uh, similarly, Moderna, in the same time when this paper came out, in the same day actually came out uh, their paper, they showed the same thing, that nucleoside modified RNA with lipid nanoparticle is a, a so powerful vaccine. Moderna actually, here in Germany, they run clinical trial on human for the same kind of vaccine. We have the COVID-19, but um, they had for uh, birth flu. But it was, you know, 200 people participated and then 200 million. So there were already human trial. And um, so that was the COVID-19 was the first which was tested out. And so we collected more information, mechanism and other things. And so when, when it came, and I don't even have to tell you that how, what happened from January to end of December, because every day everybody followed on the television that what thing happened, where was the phase one, two, three, and what is the data. And uh, you might know better than I do huh, how it uh, all occurred. And, and this year in uh, August already fully approved uh, the Pfizer vaccine. And um, if you think this was, this, this is the end and what will come now with all of the RNA is formulated. I can tell you that actually the, the future is, was already was going, ongoing, because uh, many different uh, uh, messenger RNA was already clinical trial, advanced trial for, for example, for heart failure, AstraZeneca already was phase two trial, uh, injecting to the uh, muscle of the heart, uh, those people who went to uh, bypass surgeries, to inc it was VEGFA mRNA for the scientists who are here and started to be born. So VEGFA mRNA, and then it made more blood vessel in the uh, muscle of the heart. They also used the same mRNA for uh, uh, diabetic patient who had uh, necrotic uh, wounds and increased the blood vessel and helped to heal the wound. And um, uh, so other clinical trial, they also um, used uh, for cancer vaccination, for example, and um, they did also passi passive immunization. So not because when you have uh, get the vaccine, your Im your immune cells had to respond, recognize, make antibody, cellular immunity. But uh, let's say if a doctor has to go somewhere in uh, um, Africa and then they just find somebody so some kind of disease, if they find the first person who survived, they can take their blood, they can identify why this person, what kind of antibody he's making, and then you can make from make the genes, make the RNA, inject to the doctor, and then he can, next day he can go. He's protected. So that's a passive immunization. Of course, it uh, right now different antibody is available in a clinic. Those are very expensive because the protein has to be purified, and and those are very expensive uh, things. So. But if you just inject RNA, which is always made from the four nucleotides, then uh, your body can make the protein and it will be much cheaper. And uh, you will hear now uh, in a television, radio, that how many other things is already in, in process. And uh, when Matthias uh, three years ago gave a lecture in RNA therapy meeting, which we had from 2013, you would know that even when he talked in 19, 2019, we already heard of several a group was presenting for uh, vaccine against malaria and other viruses. So this was already in process. It is just uh, the uh, pandemia accelerated uh, the whole thing. And, and of course, everybody would like to just make the trial, evaluate, uh, look at things and, and proceed. But we couldn't do that. But there was so much work was done already, which made it uh, ready. And uh, um, many things uh, it this year happened, even for the uh, promise of gene therapy, which once, you know, in the 90s, everybody was uh, doing, uh, delivering a, um, a virus which carries some uh, corrected genes for the patient. It seems now that this problem will be solved also by the RNA. And there is, was the first trial by um, uh, Intelia when they three person was permanently fixed who made uh, some uh, troubling uh, uh, toxic protein. And so as future is here and uh, 
I am, as a scientist, I am happy that I was part of this process and I worked on this field. And uh, I uh, can tell you that, as I mentioned, so many, many, many scientists worked on it and so many experts uh, in industry at uh, BioNTech, Pfizer, <laughs> Moderna, everywhere to make it happen. And, uh, and uh, that would be it. And thank you very much for coming and paying attention. <laughs> the way if you walk on the moon that's the reaction you know um this is for uh, you. what an admirable uh, role model for all the scientists particularly the young and you heard you got advice how to guide your own careers but what was so astonishing that this breathless run through there was always enough time for humor so uh, now, Katalin is generous enough to take a few questions. Are there any questions? Yes? First enzyme, you mentioned that you know if it's, if you don't produce enough, these people get ill. What, what was it and how? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, uh, it was not an enzyme. It is a transthyretin, a protein, and this uh, it accumulates. It, it is uh, um, causing amyloidosis, like a uh, and and uh, and this is toxic. So, what they did uh, with uh, delivering an mRNA, nucleoside modified RNA, coding for this enzyme called Cas9, which specifically recognizes with a guide targeting for, for that gene, which makes the bad protein, and then they can interrupt. And for three patients, this toxic protein is not produced in their body. And this Cas9 uh, is, a, uh, is an enzyme which was taken as part of the bacterial. Uh, I told you that the bacteria has things worry, so that uh, they, this is their part of their immune system and discover that um, it very specifically can see certain sequences if uh, there is a um, uh, there is a help uh, sequence there which they co-deliver and uh, so right now it was just interrupted so that uh, not making anymore so the future would be that uh, and uh, there are also uh, animal studies there to correct certain things so this this will come. Yeah, Dr. Kaneko, thank you very much. I think this was an absolutely beautiful and great talk. And then even I, as an immunologist, um, I learned a lot. <laughs> but on your very last slide, <laughs> and maybe that escaped the attention of most uh, of, of almost everyone in the audience, there was something on autoimmunity. Yes, and that is the non-immunogenic, uh, probably a uh, RNA can can curb down autoimmunity. Mm -hmm. and maybe also uh, allergic diseases. And, and I think if this would hold true, this would be another very, very important discovery for mankind. So could you say something mm -hmm. about the present stage? Are there, um, as, as Antiric, she told me about it, yeah. uh, are there um, uh, clinical studies already ongoing? Uh, no, no clinical studies. This was, um, this was so um, this was multiple sclerosis. This is an autoimmune disease. And uh, we had animal models and they were published in Science in uh, January. And uh, when you deliver an mRNA coding for the autoantigen in that case, yeah, and then you are not delivering with the uh, lipid nanoparticle, which actually is the stimulant, which adjuvant, which stimulates the immune system, but delivering just quietly, repeatedly. And the immune system will repeatedly say, okay, 
uh, say this, there is no danger, and then repeatedly uh, providing this kind of uh, setting, sooner or later start to tolerate. You know, this is uh, what I mentioned in the beginning. So uh, the immune system can, can recognize and react. You know, that's what when I told you that you are angry and you want to retaliate, the other things that, um, you know, the apologize still need uh, something. It is also here when you have a uh, uh, tolerization, you need to, the immune system recognize but tolerize. And the third one is absolutely ignore, which was I told you don't need any energy. So, but in this case already, because once it was activated and recognized, but repeatedly, if you deliver the mRNA coding for the autoantigen, and there are, you know that how many autoimmune diseases, then uh, you can induce tolerization. And this would uh, need, um, you, you need to know what is the autoantigen. Uh, and so there are rheumatoid, there are many other diseases when it could uh, treat it. In a um, in, um, case of uh, 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 diabetes, Maybe it is too late because then it already, you know, the cells are gone, uh, which produce the insulin for uh, type 1 diabetes. But um, polarization can be uh, uh, in, uh, generated this way because the RNA is not immunogenic and the lipid is not immunogenic. What, did I answer? Well, um, I appreciate your work and it's impressing. Um, I'm a psychiatrist for children and youth. This is just another field. Mm -hmm. But I've got a question which is really real. It's our life in Germany at the moment. We hear day by day the, the data from the RKI, from the Robert Koch Institute. There are thousands of thousands of, they call it, infections. But we know there are positively tested people. They are counted. And can we maybe hear a comment of you? What is infection in these days when we know there are positively tested people all over the world and they're not ill? But when we use these, this kind of, of data, when we really say, okay, they are infected when they are positively tested, then we have panic and panic is not very healthy, I think. Yeah, that's... Um Yeah, negative uh, thing, and uh, Shaya would say that we have to make uh, positive, but how we could if we understand things, because people are afraid of things which they don't understand and they don't know. And um, so Ugo told me that uh, he realized it will be a pandemic, actually, when some people asymptomatic and uh, and uh, they uh, they infected because he said that those will travel and they spread. No? And why some people get sick and why others will not get sick. No? So uh, it, it depends on, of course, the age and the other disease and what is the background and, and many other things, which, for example, how, how much uh, virus they inhale. You remember at the beginning when young doctors in China, they died and they were young. So you expect their immune system responded, but they... Well, immune system and the uh, colleague, uh, colleague with the uh, immune uh, in, uh, knowledge would um, say that if you have too much uh, virus inhaled, there is no immune system can handle immediately. So when they looked at there, you know, people um, who get um, uh, uh, okay, who get a um, little bit sick or actually who, who, who died, they looked at everybody made antibody, but those who died, they made too late. And uh, you have to know that the antibody is just recognized the free virus. So by that time, so uh, at the beginning, it can capture the free viruses, but the virus enters to the cell and the antibody looks around and cannot see it. You need, you know, cellular immunity. And that's a different kind of immune response and uh, would recognize uh, the cell. But if you have so many cells already uh, infected, those people who delayed the uh, anti antibody production, you know, they die. So people, uh, you have to understand, if you have high level of antibody in your blood, then you will have um, uh, in the, everything which is made from, from, from this. So it will be in the saliva. 
And that was very surprising, actually. You would agree uh, that the IgG, so that the same what it was in the blood, it was in the saliva. So if you have high antibody level in your blood, you get uh, the uh, virus here and it never gets lower down but yeah to the lung and other place and but what happened is everybody's you know uh, antibody level is high up and then it's uh, gradually uh, decreasing it is natural uh, all of your uh, vaccination from childhood you don't uh, make tons of uh, antibodies circulating so it goes down but you have memory cells and if you inject it twice at least then you have cellular and and uh, um, uh, memory B cells, which will make antibody if it is coming. But maybe you have a little cough cup because, you know, in your nose you won't get, and then it actually, most of the viruses, even for influenza, most of that is homemade. You made it because it's an epithelial uh, uh, device and then you inhale. So you get a little bit sick, but you won't be seriously sick because you already have uh, immune response. And um, what was the question? Okay, three questions. Okay, in your <clears throat> decades of scientific research, did you have any periods of um, scientific collaboration with the mRNA team in Tübingen of Ingmar Hör? And has it been in a way mutually productive? Yes, yeah. So... Is, is it recorded? So, um, yes, yeah, so um, 2006, um, um, when we published 2005 that uh, we can make non-immunogenic RNA, and uh, and uh, um, I met uh, Ingmar, I visited Tübingen uh, in the Kurvec. I was there in their retreat as a scientist um, from uh, Penn, and... Um, I, I greatly appreciated all, all of the scientists who were there, and um, and Ingmar visited us, um, and um, he ate there uh, this Philadelphia uh, cheesesteak, which is I hope that we did not contribute anything what happened to him, but that's uh, not a healthy food, but we forced him that he has to try when he was there. So he was he was there. He he, uh, you know, we tried to work together, and. Um, why I did not end it up there as a other story, but um, I considered, um, yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I also appreciated your talk. I uh, would like to know if uh, you have... Um, uh, if your research is going beyond the spike protein as an antigen, do you consider to use also the nucleocapsid of the virus? I remember that Hans-Georg Ramensee is now mm -hmm. trying to use a peptide mm -hmm. vaccine that he experienced in a self-injecting <laughs> approach. Yes. And, uh, and, and uh, he reported that uh, using, using the, nucleo, uh, the nucleocapsid mm -hmm. as an additional antigen... Mm -hmm could uh, give an additional benefit to a vaccine, but he is uses peptides. But do you mm -hmm. consider to use an uh, mRNA vaccine mm -hmm. on the same basis? So so my uh, role in this uh, vaccine was, you know, developing, the in, in improving the RNA as for every, every therapy. And my goal was always to make therapeutic coding. So when I started at BioNTech, uh, I... Um, I focused on uh, on therapeutic. So what a uh, first uh, project I pitched is was with Sanofi, with the mRNA coding for four cytokines, and these were making and injecting to the tumor, which is close to the surface, like melanoma, head and neck, and um, and then make uh, the immune cells. We run there, and then they can see that oh oh that that's what we have to see. And when they are circulating in an animal, they can clear. Uh, established the lung metastasis. And so I was working on this project and actually it went human trial. And that's what I am still stayed in BioNTech because I wanted first to wait for the first patient will be injected because we worked on the cap element, the other element. Uh, so, and um, so I was waiting that um, 
injected. And when it was first patient injected, I was waiting that I want to see that the patient is getting better so that I can go home and say that at least one person in my life I have. Because that's what scientists want, to see that something they work on it, that it was helpful. Because most of them, we just think that maybe somebody will use and turn. So I am not an immunologist, virologist. I, I learned from colleagues, but I am not um, developing a vaccine. And um, I am thinking uh, other diseases because there are so many acute. Actually, day one, why I did RNA, you could ask. You didn't ask it, but I can ask now. So why, why I did RNA when everybody used DNA? Because I thought that more people had, uh, had acute disease, like, he, you know, pain and aches and burns and not like uh, your genetic uh, problem you have. And so I imagine that the, the people in their freezer will have like um, collagen 7 mRNA and they cook and they burn and they run there and, you know, put the mRNA there and, you know, quickly uh, make the protein locally and then heals. So that... I, I, that's what I was thinking that would be good uh, RNA. And um, so I was not, you know, how disappointed it was when Weissman was so happy that uh, it is a great uh, molecule for vaccine. And in, so I was not thinking about and And it runs here doing a peptide, go for it. And there are also peptide vac uh, or protein vaccines. And we will see. You have to know also that when somebody now, because there is a, yeah, sorry, because there is now that the, the vaccine is fully approved. If you are thinking to introduce a new vaccine, you have to run the clinical trial with control of, of Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. That's you, you have to have always the control has to be the approved best product. So you have to make sure that it to perform better your vaccine, then it will be approved. Yeah, so that it uh, put the bar quite high for Ramenzi. <laughs> very much. My question is not scientific. Do you have a special message for people who are against vaccination or not vaccinated? Mm -hmm. So a message that could appear tomorrow in all papers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would yeah. be great. Yeah. So, so you know, first of all, there are people against uh, something which is new. Yeah. I can tell you that um, hundred years ago, um, um, the, when Röntgen, yeah, here in Würzburg, yeah, yeah, introducing X-ray. So you know, his wife, the ring, ring on her finger, and, and was photo was seen, and then uh, people who were against this uh, thing they realized that, oh, this, this will go through the clothes. And then there in, in England, they petitioned that in the binocular in the theater should not have x-ray in it because then they will see you naked. So they petitioned it. But smart people would think that um, and started and get very rich selling uh, uh, underwear, which is x-ray resistant. So there are always, there are people who, you know, who create something benefiting it. And that's what happened with the people who are saying, you know, on the, you know, the vaccine, because in the U U.S. they looked at, I, I don't remember, like 18 doctors and 16 was selling something, an alternative. They want to make money. They said that don't, don't take that and eat that. And because, you know, all of the food supplement, you don't have to prove, you can eat. And the best case scenario, you don't get sick from it, you know, and, and so there is no risk, but uh, they can make money. And if, you know, uh, they are telling say, uh, people, I, 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 and, and it is everything is political, you know, thing. but, okay. So uh, I can see that genuinely there are people who would like to understand how this RNA works. And um, uh, as a scientist, I mentioned, uh, Matthias, that we scientists didn't learn to talk to the public using, you know, I use so many dirty words here and you, if you are not in scientist you don't know what I am talking about we have to learn to talk uh, um, plain language and describe that let's say here is the virus and the virus is actually has an RNA which is an which has many messages like 30 you know one of them Ramazi was and then other and then more 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 
And then what is the vaccine is not this whole RNA, which can replicate, can go to the lung and here and different cells, but we are using just this piece and this piece, and this can go in and can make a protein and degrade and disappear. And uh, maybe, you know, we have to practice some analog to, to tell the people. And uh, some genuinely want to know, and, um, and uh, we have to explain to them. And if after that, there are other doctors are coming who have some alternative, then if we make it uh, uh, public that they, what they are selling and it will be m more known, then maybe people think twice, maybe spending some food that will inhibit the virus or something. It's good. Thank you very much for your work and uh, thank you also for not giving up working on that subject despite all these obstacles you have experienced. Uh, I have a question regarding the BioNTech uh, vaccine. Uh, once you inject the mRNA into the body, how long will it stay there? And uh, comparing that to the uh, DNA constructs uh, used by other vaccines like the AstraZeneca. So that was, would be the first question. The second question is uh, realizing the beauty of the BioNTech vaccine that you can essentially substitute the RNA very easily. And going back mm -hmm. to the uh, question which was asked a bit earlier, these days uh, almost uh, every uh, uh, COVID uh, variant which is around is the uh, Delta variant. The BioNTech vaccine, as it is currently being used, uh, has been made against a very initial virus which was uh, showing up. Uh, which doesn't exist anymore uh, and which doesn't cause any infections anymore. So how easy can BioNTech uh, make a new vaccine using, for example, an mRNA encod encoding the Delta variant spike protein? Or a new variant, which is uh, coming up eventually. Which was the first one? Well, the first question, uh, yeah. The first question was, how long does the yeah, RNA well, persist? Yeah, so that's an interesting story, again, I can tell you, because at the beginning when I was working with RNA, you know, people said, oh, you know, even if you don't uh, do anything with the already degrade. And then I said, no, no, it do not degrade immediately. There is still time that uh, inside the cell do something, yeah. And then now it's coming from the other side that, oh, it will be lo there too long. You know, when everybody's worried, oh, you have to put in a minus 70 because it degrades. And st people still worried that in their body temperature will be long, long dead. You have seen that, like, you know, four days was in the mice when, when I... It's probably that or or less. It is um, the body temperature of the mice is higher, so that um, it will uh, there for for let's say four days, and uh, and uh, it degrades. That's why I put in minus seventy because uh, you know that uh, the RNA doesn't even need an enzyme to chop chop chop. It is uh, inherent the lay by. This is a lay by molecule that was in the nineteen sixty one paper. Both papers said unstable. It is uh, for bacteria. There is a two three minutes, isn't that Matthias? Uh, two three minutes is that great? It's gone, and and so this is short time, and just enough to make the protein. And of course, the protein is different. I told you the collagen seven. You know when you burn your hand, so that is that protein is wrong because it's an extracellular matrix protein. It's around six uh, months. So that would be healed very well. And so, so you know, the protein. So the protein half-life is important also because not the RNA is the drug, but the coded protein. Or uh, when I mentioned the nitric oxide synthase, the coded protein is an enzyme which makes a, a product like nitric oxide with millisecond half-life. So you have to figure out always what is the drug. But um, answering this one, it is like uh, three, four days and translate, the protein is also quite labeled, it uh, just enough that uh, immune cells can recognize. So the first one is okay. Yeah. And the next one was um, about why we, so we are not doing the receptor binding domain. It is for the full uh, uh, spike protein, yeah, which is um, much longer. And it has it is uh, when you make immune response, you make uh, for different uh, parts, you make many different uh, uh, specificity immune cells. And and if you look at there, the original uh, vaccine, which was uh, because you, you generate the immune response, it would be different if you would get the antibody. And maybe now, actually, today I've seen that Eli Lilly pulled back their antibody because probably is not recognizing anymore what 
you know, the Delta variants, but uh, you are making immune response and your body makes a lot of different kind of immune uh, uh, antibody which will recognize that. And so it, it seemed that it was working just as well or a little bit less, but it's no need. But if there is a, you have a other uh, virus and uh, actually uh, Moderna just phase three, the cytomegaloviral vaccine or other vaccines are coming, you know, that was, uh, uh, you have to just make the just, you have to make the new template. I have to tell you that if that uh, co Corona would come 20 years ago, then, um, then, uh, uh, you needed from from those Chinese scientists to send you a package and which would get them the material because right now just the information oh that's it and uh, you could proceed because in Regensburg there were two company in 1999 formed one was the uh, Genart other was Antelecon sounds like a telephone company but they made they made uh, genes and so they can synthesize genes. And it was not, to, uh, before that, there was not. So then you can just order and of course much, many more companies and then uh, they synthesize the genes so you don't need anybody to send you any biomaterial. So immediately 150 different places, people started to make a uh, um, um, uh, vaccine. And uh, so um, was, what was the question again? Yeah, yeah, I answered. Okay, next question. Final, last question. Yes. Thank you very much for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I don't have a very scientific question, but you, on your last slide, you showed mm -hmm. that you were working on uh, uh, vaccines for uh, sickle, cell, cycle, sickle cell anemia and for malaria. Mm -hmm. And my question is, uh, are you working on uh, making the uh, mRNA more stable because uh, uh, in uh, higher temperatures, because uh, most people who have sickle cell anemia mm -hmm. and uh, um, malaria are in mm -hmm. southern countries where you don't have refrigeration, as you yep. said in the beginning of your mm -hmm. speech with Hungary. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would like to know if that's going to be one of your main aims. That, that was 66 years ago in Hungary, so they have refrigerated. <laughs> no, I know, I know. Okay. So, from, yeah, so, so first of all, the sickle cell anemia is not an infectious disease. This is a genetic disease, and those are not vaccines. Uh, my colleague, uh, Drew Weissman, is working on that project also, and uh, those are, um, uh, right now, the, the patient... Uh, uh, bone marrow is removed, the cells removed, they manipulate and then, you know, uh, fix it and put it back. And what he is working on that, um, and the, that will be the future of mRNA therapy, is that uh, you have a formulation, this uh, lipid nanoparticle, you already familiar with the word, and uh, put there something which targets so that when you inject uh, intravenously, it will go certain very specific cells. And that will be the future. And that's what they are working. So uh, also Moderna announced that they can inject in animals and it will end up in the bone marrow. And then you can change for the sickle cell anemia. You don't have to take out because uh, so many people would need and it is very expensive to take out uh, cells and put it back and fix. And then you can, in, in the patient, you can fix the cells enough that uh, they won't get sick. So they, this is a genetic disease. The malaria is a, is a parasite, as infectious, yeah. And um, of course, uh, you know, would be higher temperature, but I can guarantee that it never be uh, room temperature because this RNA will degrade. And um, so maybe whatever electricity you still plug in, a uh, freezer or something, right now that, you know, you can keep it to minus uh, 70 and uh, it can be there and when they transport, they can have a minus 20 or, I mean, I can say plus four, but, you know, when something is has a particle, like a lipid nanoparticle with the RNA, and then um, maybe on plus four, if you put a refrigerator, is okay. But when you are, you know, on the bike or something, a motorcycle, and, the, and it is shaking, 
you know, it might be a different uh, thing because they can maybe aggregate. So I think it is has to be frozen. It's better. That's what I believe. But uh, yeah. And um, so uh, I don't know. Minus 20 right now. I, I think uh, Pfizer also uh, 10 weeks can be at higher temperature, not minus 80. Why it was minus 80? You can ask why it was minus 80. Why it was three weeks? Why was 30 microgram? None of them are optimal. It's not recorded, yeah? It was, oops, it, it is. So because, because uh, this was the experience. We had experience, years of experience, keeping that kind of molecule in minus 70. And then you cannot say that, oh, probably it's good in minus 20. You have to show the data with that material that how long will be good. And even if you say, okay, well, you put there 30 microgram and then uh, maybe uh, half of them degrade, but it's still okay. It's not. You cannot have that one person will get twice as much than the other one. So, you, you know, it, it, the, everything is regulated. And and so that's why uh, was at the beginning minus 70, because that was, we had the most experience, years of experience, how experience. And then... Um, and the, those maybe maybe less would be enough, but th that was what was tested, and it would seem that uh, is uh, rational, reasonable, and uh, and uh, three weeks. We already learned that if it is n longer than three weeks, is better. But if you maybe if you say two months would be better between the two injections, maybe the clinical trial is still running. So they had to find what is the shortest time when the second is boost, not too early, but it already boost. Uh, and, and see the data. So, you know, it is nothing black and white and uh, when people say things so that there is some rationalization and it was safe. Yeah. We had an avalanche of questions online. Okay. First, just take one. Oh, I, 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 what yeah. kind of time frame, in what time frame do you expect uh, some medication, uh, mRNA, mRNA, against cancer? I I mean, uh, this is already, I mentioned with Sanofi, is ongoing, which is not vaccine. Because if it is vaccine, the RNA has to code for, for the uh, antigen, cancer antigen, viral antigen. But if it is coding for, for a molecule which see, it, um, directs the immune cells to come here, they will figure out what to see. And so that's um, that's also in a, a, in a clinical trial. And... Uh, Vaccine, of course, uh, cancer vaccine, what CureVac and all of the companies are doing, it is much more challenging because, look, Moderna and uh, Boston and um, and uh, BioNTech here selected the same identical protein because it was uh, this is one on the surface of the of the virus and it is obvious you have to target that. And maybe, you know, Ramanzi one more, but th th there is not mu many alternatives. But when you have a cancer cell, I, I mean, e the, we have to understand better. We have um, um, sequencing. So, so at the BioNTech, we have a individualized cancer vaccine program when the patient sample and the tumor sample is surviving and then sequencing, identifying which is in the tumor where... Um, the mutation of the uh, gene resulted in uh, amino acid chain so that it could be recognized by the immune cells and then figuring out what maybe those um, uh, professional uh, presenter cells will show to the immune cell. And then, you know, artificial intelligence, everything is in and testing out and try to see that whether these uh, would be good vaccines. So this is more science is needed. And uh, there is a lot of uh, experience, and we are uh, doing with uh, Genentech, and um, uh, CureVac is doing probably for uh, non-modified RNA would be good for that, because for cancer, you don't need antibody. The cancer cell is not putting up a big protein, and then the uh, antibody would recognize. It needs cellular immunity. It needs a cell to come, come co go there, and help yourself to tell the others, come, come here and kill that. And uh, so, um, again, you know, coming back to the people who make money for uh, antioxidant, you know, the people who told me that, uh, you know, I am doing everything to protect myself from this uh, virus. I eat antioxidant. 
those people are scientifically not um, educated because actually our immune system, the, the, the immune cells, are not killing with the gun. They are using the oxidative stress. So if you take antioxidant, you are just working against the, your own immune system. So, so that uh, that was, you know, again, uh, lack of knowledge, you know, and then people, they try to do good thing, you know, to protect themselves, but they are not doing good. So, so the immune system is using oxidative burst to burst uh, through and kill, kill the bad cells, the cancer cells, the viral infected cells. So don't take antioxidant tomorrow morning. Thank you very much. You know that um, usually when I have my presentation and I want to finish in the high note, I show a picture of my daughter who is two times Olympic champion and <laughs> rower. <laughs> but in these days, she's showing a picture of me. <laughs> Thank you. And is there a better apology for science than this evening? And our goal of uh, a kind of uh, new uh, period of uh, dominance of enlightenment. You hear tonight, enlightenment can be so witty and so broad. So um, please. Yeah. Be faithful to this festival. You will add pages and pages uh, that are encouragements to follow the recommendation of Catalin Carico. I, I might say also to the young one, I forget to say one thing, that you have to believe in yourself. Can you imagine going from Kishu Salaj, the city, you know, the, where I grew up, and going to University of Pennsylvania, seeing this, uh, all of these very smart scientists and how intimidating could be that to thinking that me coming here was think something that these people who, you know, fluent in English, I was starting when I was 18, learning so, so many, you know, things which not going for me. And then I would think about something that those so many smart people will not think. And I, I said, why not? And uh, so that's what I am telling the young one. Don't, don't get intimidated with believe in yourself, love what you are doing. Okay, maybe not science, but maybe you can enjoy something else. Uh, but the work, what you are doing, you have to enjoy. Because how many times I told my colleagues that, oh, I wish I would be one week older because by that time I would know what is the outcome. And so it is full of excitement. You are looking forward that I hardly can wait to get up and go to work and, and you have to find some job that uh, doing, you know, for you, that you have excited about because, uh, you know, rest of our life we are going to work and if we don't enjoy it, then it will be a horrible life. So that you have to enjoy, you have to believe that why not and... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah.